I'll start by just saying a little bit about who I was, or who I still am, but with a reference to stuff that I've done. Um, here's four projects uh, which maybe uh, demise the last seven years of my time in interactive storytelling. I used to run a company called Story Mechanics, and that was part of a television company called Turn Television Productions. Now, Turn uh, made television. Uh, and one of their TV programs they made was for Channel 4 Education, and they did a 26 um, part uh, kids' TV show called KNTV. So when I, when I uh, founded the gaming division within Turn, one of the challenges I had um, in line with Channel 4's uh, ambitions to move into sort of digital multi-platform content was how can we translate what we've got on television into the digital domain? How can we migrate audiences from sort of passive viewers into sort of interactive participants of some sort of digital story world? So we created something called Sobovia.tv, which was effectively extracting the world and the characters out of the television series, which was about this fictional state of Slavovia, which was a communist dictatorship, um, all in this cartoon rendered style. Um, so what we did is I literally sort of mined the episodes we had. There was 18 months when we did it initially, moved up to 26. Pulled out the characters, pulled out the world, pulled out the themes. Sort of deconstructed it and then put it all back together in a different form. And we came up with this uh, web, multimedia web proposition um, called Slavovia.tv, which had a front end, uh, sort of a, a, had a weekly updated state propaganda newspaper, which basically told you what was going on in Slavovia at any point in time. All of the, um, all of the articles in it either were related to what the users were doing or what Slavovia in our story world was doing. Uh, we released a whole lot of games, released some albums, we also ran a, a, a social networking site where people could come in and designate themselves uh, to be a, a Slovakian character. So I was like Simon Mikski and I was asked to um, take a profession, so I was like you know, a pig polisher. And these are the sort of things which we did. And then once I, and that, that allowed me entry into this sort of uh, closed social networking forum. At which point we just played games. Uh, so we were all the, the major characters and we had control of the world events. And everybody who came in there, they were part of the populace. So um, one of the characters I controlled was the, the dictator, who was called General Shmerdyakov. And he had this really great way of making uh, users do stuff by saying, if you don't do it, I'm actually going to punish you. Um, so this threat of punishment was also sort of carrot on the stick, or this was a bat. Uh, behind them, uh, get them to do stuff. And then when we did stuff, and it was great, I mean, it was all fun and games. When we did stuff, what we did is we, so we might say, a pig has just eaten Slavovia's library, and um, it was a big pig. And uh, what we need to do is re reconstruct all the tomes which are in there. So they would go in there and they might say, okay, well, Grime and Punishment was a, a big bestseller. So we collectively would ask the audience to reconstruct a, a version of Grime and Punishment. Once they put it together, we would bind it up and we'd send it back out with them. So they collectively felt that they'd built something. We built this whole world on this notion of, if you do stuff, we'll do stuff. And it was a very sort of, it was a really nice symbiotic type relationship. <clears throat> and we got, did never actually got huge audience figures, but actually as far as the audience participation was pretty massive. People would come and spend sort of half an hour to an hour, almost a day uh, of those several thousand would do it, sort of interacting, sort of creating content, putting up content, and just sort of, it's quite a nice little community which is going on there. So. That, that all happened about six years ago. Um, I was always quite, you know, the, the notion of interactive storytelling um, within a documentary form was always interest me. And uh, when I was at Turn, we did a TV series called The Beauty of Maps, and I did the online companion piece on that. And they, basically, the, the, the pitch on that was let's take the Esper photo analysis machine thing from Blade Runner, where you can sort of get a picture, zoom right in, and find out more about the story, and apply it to maps. So we took all these maps and we gave this deep zoom capability where effectively you went on a treasure hunt through these ancient maps, and when you found points of interest, it exploded a whole load of information about it. So you were sort of exploring documentary evidence, but you were doing it in a way that was based on your own sort of intrigue and priority systems. Nobody was saying, do this first, then that, then that, and that. It was very much around what interests you most about what you're seeing, and then we'll tell you something about it. And then you went on a sort of treasure hunt through it. Um, I was also worked with Sony PlayStation on devising their Wonderbook product, which was the notion about that was uh, using the book as a controller and uh, augmented reality, using the PlayStation Eye to make the stories effectively jump out of the book, and you can have some sort of controlling influence on the, on the book which, which you've got in front of you. Uh, and then, uh, 
a year ago, almost exactly a year back, we released the third opening steps, which was a digital adaptation of the John Buckingham novel, which I'll talk a little bit about later. So I, I did about, in total, there was about 15 or 16 projects we ended up doing, but I think these four shows the diversity of what I was working on. Just before Christmas, uh, I, I left um, Story Mechanics and decided to set up the simple Secret Experiment, which is my new game studio, which is all about, um, I suppose, experiments and form and how uh, different forms of gameplay mechanic can be used to tell interesting and compelling um, narrative experiences within the game world. Um, still early days with that. Uh, we've won various bits of funding, we've got some projects in the pipeline, uh, still fairly secretive, but again, I'll, I'll allude to some of the stuff we're doing around that bit later on. Um, but anyway, so this, this talk itself is sort of about games, storytelling, and the 39 steps. Um, so I'll attempt to uh, tackle them in that, <coughs> that order. So, this is where my brain's at. I must, I must put this sort of a caveat on all of this, that some things I write stuff on the page, I read it off the, um, the presentation and I disagree with it vehemently because I don't you know how it is. You know, what you write isn't always what you feel, it's just what happens to splurge out your brain at the moment in time. Um, but let's hope that at least the first couple of slides are, 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 <laughs> are in line with what. So, there's a groundswell to deliver narrative through game play. Okay, well, that, that'll sort of go along with that. You know, people are exploring ways to deliver narrative through the, the gaming sort of, uh, model. And I think there's three sort of primary ways that they're doing that. They're ever using stories as a way to contextualize gameplay. And I think this is, this is what we're used to within the games community. You know, what we do is we use story to frame the game you're about to play. And at its simplest, maybe somebody's been, you know, there's been a kidnapping and you've got to, you know, shoot your way through 50 people to, to, to rescue that person. Um, so, and, and this is very often a very bookended way of, of uh, looking at story in as much as what we do is we, we frame uh, the story, leave a, a level of cliffhanger, make you run through a, a series of action events, and then we, we plug something at the, at the end, which is sort of your reward. It sort of uh, concludes that little bit of gameplay you're doing, and then, lo and behold, there's another uh, big question mark thrown at you, and then you have to go and do a bit more um, gameplay to sort of get to the next bit of story. There's also this, this trend around story as the core mechanism now, which you, you're seeing in the likes of Quantic Dreams of Heavy Rain and, um, and also uh, maybe The Walking Dead by Telltale Games and stories. That we're actually using, the, 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 the su supporting the notion of story being the main driver of gameplay. So everything you are doing as, as a gameplay component should be having some sort of direct impact on the narrative. And they, they like to think of this notion of cause and effect, which sort of, sort of give you, you know, notions of branching narratives. If you do this, this might happen. If you do that, something else might happen. And then there's also the notion of story as outcome, which basically is like the game itself is a story generator. Um, I think most, uh, most recently, I probably should be showing examples with this, so apology, but most recently, um, you might have games such as Journey, which is Journey's this beautiful um, game where you're this sort of uh, almost faceless character running through the desert, um, you know, on, on a journey which is very enigmatic. But what happens on your journey is you meet other character, other faceless characters who are a bit like you, and the way you interact, the just that interaction uh, forms in your brain the notion of story. Um, and, and actually, what a, what a story but the interaction of characters, really, anyway. So, um, and what's nice about that is when the story is an outcome, uh, is, a, is that play within a game? Often that means after you've played it, you'll go and discuss it and you'll share your stories with friends. It has a real sort of water cooler moment in, in a TV sense. So, I think that, I mean, they're, they're sort of, you know, fairly broad, but I think that those three sort of uh, hold water as to what's happening at the moment. Um, all of them within the context of story we require innovation in the game mechanics like how, how do we put across this story context um, which comes with an inherent commercial risk um, which i'll come on to in, in a little bit um, basically i mean in a nutshell if you're trying to do something which hasn't already been done within the context of a, of a business there is a risk that you might not be able to do it or what you do isn't well done um, so there's something about, you know, the games market, there's a lot of, sort of copycat copycatting, there's a lot of sort of taking established genres and just reskinning it, but the, 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 that, that makes commercial sense, particularly if it pulls in an audience. If you try and do something where you don't know if the audience is there and you don't know whether your game mechanics themselves are going to pay off, well, there's a commercial risk. Uh, and, you know, on to that, the audiences are less understood <coughs> for product which is very narrative focused, so new audiences are less understood, which is again, it's a commercial risk, you, you have to sort of 
assume that you're going to shift so many copies and you need an audience to do that to sort of justify the work you're doing. I gave a talk at Canongate conference and I was trying to sort of explain to um, people in the book world the, what, what it is to tell a story within a gaming context. And um, after sort of scratching my head and writing loads of post-it notes on my dining room table and my kids coming in and messing them up, which is actually quite a good method for writing a, um, a presentation generally, you come back, what? What does all this mean? Um, it's sort of, uh, I suppose it's a bit like um, William Burroughs' cut up technique, technique approach to writing a presentation. But uh, what was nice is this notion of the audience metamorphosis came out because of the, 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 the sort of forces in the universe pulling together my post-it notes in a particular way. Um, and it's dead simple, uh, to the point that it's obvious, but I actually thought it was quite nice. And as much as media changes us, and I really like that concept. So we all start as audiences, but then audiences become something during an interaction with the media. So if, you're, if the media is a book, your audience turns into a reader. If it's television, you become a viewer. If it's a radio, you become a listener. And if it's a game, you become a player. Um, and again, it sounds really obvious, but um, I, I think if we, if we deliver stories as games or any sort of interactive wrapper in that sense, we have to start regarding the audience as players. Now, Okay, it sounds obvious, but honestly, it is missed all the time. People assume when you say story, you, 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 pre, you, you, you put a different emphasis on what the audience is. But actually thinking of the audience as a player when the story is delivered through a game is interesting because what do players do? Um, okay, so the player in the game. Players like to interact. They like a notion of control. They like choice. They like to feel that they're influencing, responding to stuff, connecting with stuff. But ultimately, they like to feel that they're playing a part. Okay, so this takes us to stories and games basically means that the audience is playing a part. And again, it sounds really obvious, but it was, it was really sort of, there was a moment of clarity in my mind with some of this. So if they're playing a part, the question is, is okay, so we're creating a story in an interactive medium. So what, what is the player's role? Can you clearly define that? What is their connection to the story? I mean, why are they there at all? Uh, and why do they care? How is the story perceived and written to reflect this connection? And how is the outcome entertaining? So, I mean, all of these things, I think, within the context of, the, of your audience being a player, I think is relevant. And the, the answer lies somewhere between the notion of gameplay and role play. Um, so, Mario is a really good example of a, uh, a pure essence of gameplay. I mean, nobody plays Mario. Okay, there is a story in there, but nobody thinks they're Mario. Um, at least I've never met anybody who thinks of Mario. Certainly, I haven't thought I was Mario when I was playing it. I know I'm moving around a wee character and I have control over him and I'm sort of helping him along his journey, but I don't actually think I'm Mario. In fact, if somebody said to me, okay, you're playing as Mario, who are you? Who is Mario? I think I'd be stumped pretty quick. I think he used to make Peter's, he probably still does, but I think that element of his character's probably been a bit lost. In fact, I think way back he used to be a carpenter, so I think even, even the notion of who Mario is within the context of Nintendo is a little bit open to um, debate apart from the fact that he looks vaguely like that. He seems to be getting younger. Um, I, don't know, I suppose we all aspire to that. Um, but the notion of role play is different, and I think there's certain games, like if you look at some of the stuff Quantic Dream's done, I think what they're trying to do is they're trying to push you into the characters, make you connect a bit more with who these people are, and actually make the decisions that you're making within the context of the game to be that of a role play variety. What would that character do? Unfortunately, I was thinking, how many times have you ever been explicitly asked to role play in a game? How many times have you ever heard, every decision you're making from now on has to be within the guise of this character. Um, I don't know if I've ever been explicitly asked to do that in a, in a game, and if I had, it would fall back into the fact do I understand enough about this character, the situation they're in, and who they are, to actually make those decisions on their behalf? Um, uh, so I did a whole presentation on this thing, I put a boil it down to a single slide, which is basically this notion of the player as a player character. So if you are being asked to role play, um, a conflict can start to arise if you're questioning your role in this game and the capacity which you're meant to act. So this is a shot from Bioshock Infinite, where very early on in the game, you're, you're, you're seeing through the eyes of Booker DeWitt. You, you have movement control over him, I'm not quite sure exactly who he is or why he's there. I mean, there's a few hints. I mean, they like to embed the story of his past in the, in the play. But the thing is, I'm, I'm quickly asked, you know, within this context, there's these two slaves on the stage, and this guy throws, gives me a ball and tells me to throw the ball at the, at the slaves, and I'm given the choice as whether I'm going to do that or not. And what's quite interesting there is, you know, um, 
the, 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 the presupposed idea here is, aha, we're going to put a moral dilemma in the mind of the player. Of what are you going to do? But the, to me, the question is, isn't what am I going to do? Because, well, I wouldn't do that. But actually, within the context of this character, I'm meant to be role-playing, what would he do? Do I know enough about Book of the Wit to think, actually, has he got a moralistic core? Or is he so determined and is his belief system so set that actually, you know what, he, he's, he's here to do a mission and he's not going to derail his final outcome by, you know, throwing this ball or not at them. I mean, obviously, the irony being that you may think, ah, he wouldn't do that because he's got, he's got a moralistic core, core, but within a minute, he's shooting down hundreds of people for no apparent reason. So, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a conflict running constantly through that. Um, so, thinking about all that, I thought I'd move on slightly to whether the notion of gameplay is a storytelling framework. Um, so, games change audiences and players. Uh, players have control, and what shape does this control take? So this notion of what shape does this control take is tied into the notion of game mechanics and the gameplay. So the gameplay as a storytelling framework is all about what shape does this control that the player have uh, of the story thing. So um, I think that breaks down two things. You've got to have gameplay designed to reflect and accommodate the story. Which makes sense. But also gameplay to reflect and accommodate the player character. Um, so, if your player character is a pacifist, and you're, you happen to find a gun, and somebody happens to run into the room, and you are, happen to be able to point the, the window and press fire, if that actually happens and you kill the person in front of you, does that reflect the player character? No, would it not be much more, uh, would it not be much more relevant and, and sort of uh, in keeping with the character, actually at the point that you let the player do that, at the point of firing, the, 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 the gun pulled away. I and mean, you know, there was a mechanic restricting, you know, the, the player character themselves stepped in. Um, uh, I put this on, uh, again, it's, it's, it's slightly off on a tangent, but I think it's sort of relevant. Um, my sort of interest in, uh, in gameplay came from when I was a kid anyway, and uh, there was me and my two older sisters. I had a younger brother, but he was only probably about six months gurgling at the time, so he couldn't really get involved in some of the games we played. Um, but my dad used to like, sort of grab us around, around pull us around the um, dining room table, and he used to have a map and he used to have various little bits of items of stuff and he used to re uh, recreate these sort of role-playing experiences which were sort of nominally based on H.P. Uh, Lovecraft stories which might be, uh, in retrospect, slightly too terrifying for a six-year-old to be playing but, um, but at the time they really drew me in and what he did is he, he, he put the map on, he embodied the characters and we all role-played characters who were moving into that world so he might say, you know it, it might be that you get a call at in the middle of the night, and it's um, he often called himself like uh, my dad's called Robert Meek, so he often just called himself Robert Keem, where he, in you know, sneaky inverted his last name there. So Robert Keem and said, yeah, come, you know, come and visit us. I need I need your help. And me and my sisters would hypothetically sort of jump into this and say, yeah, yeah, we're, we're detectives here. And he'd be like, look, you know, the, I bought this house in um, in the city and. Uh, you know, it's had several residents over the past few years. They're all dying or going missing, etc., etc. And all of a sudden, cool, and they'd be like, right, you know, I've got some money. Here's the keys. Just please go and find out what's happening. So we'd all just delve in. All we had is this map and the notion of character which we were which we were forming. Um, and what was lovely about that is, you know, we were just running around, going into various houses, and we, I mean that at the time would take on the persona of the shopkeeper and stuff. And he had the whole story mapped out in his head, but us as a bunch of kids were just un unpicking it as we were going through. Um, this, so there's two things there which is, which, is, which is genius. One is that you've got a human games master who can sort of intuitively respond to what the players are doing. So, okay, so there's, a, there's a difficulty in that within uh, interactive storytelling generally. But also the character, we, we pre-made our characters. The, the, who we were was sort of, projections of what we'd formed in our own minds. We weren't being told, oh, by the way, your book had written, here's your entire back, back story. So um, there's a couple of reasons why that worked quite nicely. Um, I'm moving through this super fast as there's probably like uh, 17 presentations crammed into one and I'm keeping an eye on this, uh, on this, on this time mechanism of involvement. So um, character control. So yeah, so if the player is embodying the notion of a preformed protagonist, where does the line Where's that line drawn between the two parties? So 
when is the character in control and when is the player in control? Which is really interesting because actually games often give you total control to the point that you can have a conversation with somebody and jump around the room inanely as they're speaking to you and their head will be following you. Um, which is interesting, I suppose, if your character happens to be a kangaroo, most on. Um, but, what, but then, on, on the other hand, they also impose things called cutscenes, where they actually throw out all control from you and say, actually, no, no, this is, this is a bit of action which happens. And you've got to think, so what, why is that line being drawn? Why have one, and one notion line being in complete and total control of this character, and then on the other hand, having everything ripped away from you? Um, and I think it's about whose belief system would prevail as well. I mean, if there's a moralistic choice about to happen, and if you are indeed playing the protagonist and there's a story at work there, surely the belief system is actually one of the main things which is sort of, you know, helping us on this story thing. So it, it, who, who is who's actually writing the story? Is it me? Am I changing fundamentally this character or is this character fundamentally changing me? And I think that's, there's a, an interesting couple of questions in there. Um, yeah, and should the player have uh, total freedom over bodily movement? I mean, it's, it's really interesting. I like, was playing the new uh, Chinese room game which is called uh, Machine for Pigs. And one of the first things they say is, is you can pick stuff up and throw it. So like my character was in a room and you pick up a chair and just start throwing it across the room. I'm just like, oh, is this, does this embody what my character is? Is he sort of a maniac, old sort of chair thrower? Um, I, I don't think it really had much sort of bearing on the overall game apart from I had to pick up a few fuses along the way, but who knows, I never finished it, so maybe at the end it was the throwing of a chair which was actually going to save my character. Um, but also this notion of jumping, uh, occasionally games are quite brave and they restrict movement, uh, like I suppose, just going back to the other Chinese room, in the first Chinese room game they restricted uh, running, um, which was interesting, or maybe the character had a gammy leg and he couldn't run. Um, but I mean, but what's interesting about that is when you restrict stuff within a gameplay and environment where people expect total freedom, you often get really bad responses. But actually, without restricting stuff, how can you craft characters? Which is interesting, I think. I keep saying it's interesting just to confirm that I think it's interesting even the audience does. Um, um, so, does the game system need to respond to the player's whims or does it need to reflect the outrages of the player character? Uh, I'm not quite sure what I mean, but yeah, it's quite nice to do it. So. Take from that as you want. Um, and actually, yeah, ultimately, get, bear in mind you've got these two things constantly in battle. Can the player character ever be seen as anything but schizophrenic? Um, you know, ultimately, you have a character within a character. I just wish the world outside would react to this strange sort of conflict which is going on. Um, okay. So, this is the conundrum. Uh, she wrote some train coming up, so this is really pretty fun. Uh, I sort of got in my mind that most stories are actually deterministic. Most stories about my life, if I was to tell you anecdotally, are pretty deterministic, and as much as they've happened, I know where they go and they've actually been there. Most, obviously, a book deterministic, you can pick it up, it actually has a physical shape or form, it has an end page which you can look to, you know, and I know quite a few people who read, read the last page um, first. Uh, and TV, any sort of passive media is generally quite deterministic, most. Um, <clears throat> but games offer this lovely possibility to break this model. Um, and actually, they must break this model. If you offer control to people, well, invariably, you're putting millions of different uh, personalities in the shell and they will all respond differently. So actually, the notion of a, a, the story in a game being deterministic in itself is in conflict because that just sort of, this wouldn't happen. Um, so, um, the, the question from this is how control be applied in a way that doesn't contradict character? And but still offering this notion of a non-deterministic story, or how can gameplay be designed that will accommodate how the player wants to wire the story? Um, so how do we how do we form the gameplay experience in such a way that we can allow a non-deterministic model? And traditionally, you get things like branching narratives, which are you know, well, if they do this, the story will move off in one direction. If they do the other thing, it will move off in another direction. Uh, again, a whole load of complex in doing that. But it all comes down to the fact, so the whole lot of questions there, I know I appreciate I'm not really supplying any answers, um, but maybe they're just meant to be questions. Um, but actually they are being answered all over the place by experiments in form. And a few uh, of my experiments in form that I always throw up is um, DSX Machina. Uh, actually, you know what I'll do? I'm going to show you some videos of these things because it saves me from talking.